for joining us for the hemp webinar today. It's the first, um, first webinar in a series that we'll be doing monthly. Um, join us for lunch once a month and hear some exciting new stuff going on in hemp, as well as some stuff um, that might help guide you through, through the journey if you're growing. Um, today, we had some technical difficulties. So our, in lieu of um, too much introduction, um, I'm Becky. I'm from Running Brook Farms um, in Killingworth, Connecticut. I'm a hemp farmer and, um, you know, we've been doing it for two seasons now, approaching the third season here in Connecticut. And um, yes, so I'm part, um, I'm representing the Connecticut Hemp Industry, Industrial Hemp in Association, um, CHIA, and that's, I've been engaged with them for, for the two years that they've formed and um, they're also here to help, you know, try to build a robust hemp community in the state. And, um, and yeah, so without much ado, first we're gonna hear from Matt and Kate with the Department of Ag. Matt Snurkowski joined the Connecticut Department of Agriculture in the spring of 2020. He has a BS in forestry from the University of New Hampshire and has a diverse agricultural background. Kate Nelson has worked with the Department of Ag for the last four years in um, agricultural marketing and inspection representative. She has an associate degree in veter veterinary technology and graduated from UConn with a bachelor's degree in animal science. So most of you probably know Kate and Matt um, if you're growing in the state. So here we go, let's hear from you guys. Awesome, thank you so much, Becky. So I'm gonna pull up my PowerPoint and can you see that? Sure can. Okay. Awesome. So again, I'm Kate Nelson with the Connecticut Department of Agriculture. And I just want to touch on the USDA hemp final rule that came out uh, last week on January 15th. Um, so we, the department, are currently working um, and reading through it, see how it's going to affect um, you guys, the growers. Um, but it shouldn't there's, it doesn't look like there will be a ton of changes. Um, listed here are some key provisions of the final rule that USDA put out. So negligent violations, disposal and remediation of non-compliant plants, testing using BEA registered laboratories, timing of sample collection, sampling method, and extent of tribal regulatory authority over the territory of the tribe. Um, and so we'll have more information in the next few you know, weeks, months, um, as we uh, digest what USDA has written. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt to talk about the application. Thanks, Kate. You have the next one, please. So I'm just going to give a brief update on the 2021 application, hemp application through the state of Connecticut. Um, for growers or producers who are looking to get a license, you can go to elicense.ct.gov. And down at the bottom left of the screen, you can click on register. Next. So a few key changes for this year. The USDA regulations define key participants. And a key participant means a sole proprietor or partner in a partnership or a person with executive managerial control in an entity, including a person such as a Chief Executive Officer, Chief Operating Officer, and Chief Financial Officer. So currently, our program will be requiring a FBI background check. Um, at the present time, we've suspended that until we have a State Department of Agricultural approval by the FBI. So once our criminal history check program has been approved, We'll notify all producers and we'll, have, we'll allow 60 days to complete the background checks for individual applicants and key participants. Next. So a key change, um, if you are applying as a business entity, you must create an account for your business. If you log into it as an individual using your personal ID and enter business entity information, your application may be rejected or you may be inadvertently affect other credentials that you already had in your uh, e-licensed system. So an entity means a corporation, joint stock co company, association, limited partnership, 
limited li limited li liability partnership, uh, limited liability company, irrevocable trust, the state charitable organization, or other similar organization, including an organization participating in the hemp um, production as a partner in a general partnership, or a participant in a joint venture, or a participant in a similar organization. So the required documents to complete the application, um, this is all uploaded through our e-license program. It includes a site location um, documentation to include latitude and longitude coordinates of the area you're growing, a map showing the boundaries and a legal description of each plot. And once again, all these documents must be uploaded through our e-license system. We cannot accept any paper copies. A key change this year um, are lots. Lots are registered in the e-license system um, and must use a farm service agency identifier assigned by the farm service agency. This will be um, registered as a farm number, um, a track number, a field number, and possibly a subfield number, depending on how many lots you split your fields into. Um, so you can log into online services and click on um, address and general maintenance tab. And there you'll select the start button with your hemp producer license and use the down menu to select FSA lot updates. Next. So when you enter your lot information into e-license system and register with FSA, think about how you're dividing up your land or greenhouses. A lot must be planted with the same variety of hemp and will be sampled as one. Uh, we intend on, on tracking the planting of, we intend on tracking planting to sampling to harvest and storage using the FSA lot number. So the term of the license um, for, for this year, we're issuing a three-year license from the date issued and it does not automatically renew. If any of the information on your licenses, license application changes, you must notify the department within 15 days in writing and receive approval of the changes before the changes are effective. Fees for this year, there's a $50 application fee that is non-refundable, a three-year license fee of $450, and this includes the first acre of hemp you plant. And each additional acre of hemp you plant is a $30 fee. Next. And more detailed application information, you can call us at our hemp line or e email agr.hemp at ct.gov. And I'll turn this over to Kate to go through reporting requirements and a rundown of 2020 data. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. So I'm going to quickly go over the reporting requirements for hemp producers, and they're very similar to last year. So we have the planting reports. You'll have an indoor and outdoor report. You must uh, put your FSA lot ID number for that lot in there, and then general information about when you planted. And again, this must be submitted in the e-license system. Now, harvest request. So this is the formerly the harvest report. So we just changed the, the title. Um, you, um, similar information from last year, you'll have to include the date when the harvest will be completed and it must be within the 15 days of sampling and where you'll be drying and storing the harvested hemp. And again, this report must be submitted in the e-license system. Hemp sampling, so it must be complete, completed for each lot, which means it must be completed for each variety. So you have one variety per lot, um, which means one sample per variety per lot. Um, and you can continue to collect your own pre-harvest samples until um, the hemp pilot program date is out. So September 30th, 2021 um, may change to December 31st, 2021, um, based on the new hemp um, USDA final rule, um, that will be, you know, you'll be notified if that's the change. Um, and then you'll have the post-harvest report. 
Um, similar information to last year, we did add a few things. So you'll have to upload your sample results for that plot. And you'll have to include your sample accession or report number, as well as the laboratory name. And so there are a few other reports if necessary. So if you need to um, destroy your crop for any reason, um, you'll have to submit the destruction report. Um, and you'll have to enter the plan date of destruction, um, Connecticut DOAG embargo number if it's been embar embargoed for any reason, um, acres square feet to be destroyed, destruction reason, plan destruction method, and salvage plan. Um, this says available until 9-30-2021, but again, this might change due to the um, USDA final rule coming out. So we will let you know on that. Lot modification, um, you will have to uh, submit um, the site ownership permission to use land if not owned. The in, is it indoor or outdoor acres slash square ooh, acres or indoor square feet? Longitude and latitude address, and you have to upload a map of the lot. And you also must have an FSA lot ID because that, again, that is your lot identifier. And this is going to be submitted in the e-license system. Application modification. So this is going to be used to modify key participants and business information. And this is another e-license system report. So the 2020 hemp production data, we had 140 grower licenses and 14 processor licenses. And just to Clarify again, um, so this year we, it's the hemp producer license, which combines the grower license and the processor license. So in 2020, we had 156 acres of hemp planted and you can see the planting dates varied, but it really picked up um, in June, July. So hemp varieties, we had 58 different varieties planted. The most common were cherry wine, cherry blossom and young sim 10 and mountain mango. And uh, this is a seed label, and so on the application, you do not need to include seed, a seed label or seed um, seed information, um, but we will ask for the variety names on all the reports, the planting report, harvest report, etc. Um, but we do recommend that you still have get a seed label from the company, um, especially for your records. Um, harvested hemp, we had 134 acres harvested, and you can see in the graph here that the harvest really picked up um, late September, early October, and um, a little bit into November, but that's not shown there. And so we had some people report where they sold their hemp, in-state versus out-of-state, and majority were able to sell it in-state. THC results, um, we did have a few people test over the 0.3 THC and um, over the minimum, um, the measurement of uncertainty. <laughs> That's the term. Um, and so you can see here in the graphs there, it, it uh, shows those numbers. And 2020 hemp destruction, we had approximately 10 acres uh, destroyed and 10,000 square feet destroyed. And the main reasons for the destruction were failed THC tests, where we had six acres destroyed and um, most of the 10,000 square feet destroyed. Some had bud rot and mold and they had to be destroyed and others were had crop damage from storms that um, were destroyed. So DOAG inspection and embargoes. We completed some gross site inspections, which we confirmed the GPS coordinates of the plots and confirmed the variety of hemp planted. Um, this year we will still be doing that, but we uh, will not be checking the variety of hemp planted. Um, and we embargoed, we had 21 embargoes. Um, and these were mainly due to high THC tests, unacceptable seed varieties, and harvested without permission. And as Matt said earlier, if you have any questions, please contact us. This is our phone number. Um, that's our email address. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Becky. Sorry. Okay, great. Thanks, Kate and Matt. Um, Super informative, and I know there's a lot of changes going on. Um, I want to invite all participants um, and attendees to use the Q and A, um, use the Q and A function to add some questions, and at the end we'll be able to come back to them. Um, right now, I think it's best just to kind of move through due to timing. But um, really quick, Kate, one thing I didn't see you mention is whether or not there's still a requirement for the 200 feet from your neighbors or any, any um, are there any federal modifications in the new rollout to those kinds of um, restrictions? No, the restriction that we had last year 
um, that required you couldn't grow hemp within the 200 feet of a, a residence not owned by you or um, 500 feet of a school or recreational facility, that is no longer in our law. So um, we do still recommend that you are on good rapport with your neighbors. Uh, that's always helpful. <laughs> That we don't have that requirement anymore. And I do see a question in the chat. Um, can a single lot have more than one variety of hemp? No, it needs to be, each lot can only have one variety. So if you plan on having multiple varieties, you need to make different lots. And just to be clear, because this is new for me too, that means a different FSA lot, like a different lot all the way through, right? Yeah. Yes, a different lot all the way through. Yeah, it has to be separate, separate coordinates, separate maps and everything. And sorry, I see one more question um, from, I believe it's Jeff. Since the USDA final rule changed harvest window to 30 days, will CT also uh, do the same as well? We are reviewing their sampling um, procedures, USDA sampling procedures to see how uh, they are. So we're going to review those and then we'll, we will let you know if we will change that. Okay, so thank you. Um, we will we will move on now to our next speaker. We're Je Dr. Jessica Lubel Brand is joining us from UConn. She's an associate professor professor of horticulture in the Department of Plant Science and Landscape Architecture at UConn. Since 2017, she's been conducting research on hemp focused on feminized seed production by masculinization, phenotypic and genotypic analysis of self and outcrossed feminized seed, um, production of polyploids and tissue culture micropropagation. So a lot going on there at, in Jess's lab and we look forward to um, hearing more detail. Okay, thank you. All right, so I will share my screen. And go to this. So hopefully you can see the screen and you can hear me. Thank you for having me today. Um, this presentation is a little bit on the sciencey side, but um, I think it has broad application to growing, um, perhaps down the line. So um, some things may be a little new to you and some things may be, well, conjure memories of, of biology and some things maybe you've, you've picked up and started studying on your own because you're involved in hemp. So, oops. Hemp is what we call a diploid plant, a diploid organism, which means that it has two sets of chromosomes. Um, just like humans and all other animals, we have two sets of chromosomes and we're diploid organisms. We get one set from mom and one set from dad when we uh, form as a zygote. And the same thing happens in many plants. Uh, so this is just showing the uh, sexual reproduction in plants where um, following pollination and then fertilization, an egg with one set of chromosomes, which we call haploid, fuses with pollen or sperm, um, which also has one set of chromosomes and is haploid. And together that makes a diploid seed with two sets of chromosomes. So as we know with hemp seed set can be problematic if you're growing for flower or for CBD because seed set reduces your yield of flower. It reduces your CBD concentration in the flower because the energy of the plant is being diverted to seed production instead of CBD production and more floral tissue and trichomes. Um, also, if you have seeds present in the inflorescence, um, the seed oil can dilute the extraction oil, the CBD oil. If you're trying to sell a flower product, it can make it unsaleable because seeds don't burn or vape well, whatever um, the intended use is. And we know that scouting for male flowers, whether it be a spontaneous couple of male flowers on a female plant or male plants themselves, largely male plants, is labor intensive and adds into the production costs. So one possible solution for seed set is to use triploid hemp. Um, triploid hemp would have three sets of chromosomes, unlike diploid hemp. 
uh, what happens is when a triploid plant tries to um, make eggs for pollination and fertilization, they are inviable. So you don't get seed set. And this is the same technology or breeding strategy that's been used to develop seedless watermelon, citrus, bananas, even hops. So when you go and buy a watermelon at the store and it's a seedless watermelon, that is a triploid. And that plant has three sets of chromosomes in its cell, in its cells. So if we were to make a triploid hemp plant, it would not be impacted by pollen drift. To make a triploid, you need to cross a diploid, a regular diploid with what's called a tetraploid. And this is what they do, the, the drawing here on the right, uh, it, with watermelon. So with watermelon, when they're making seedless watermelon, they take a tetraploid mother that has four sets of chromosomes and they cross it with a diploid male flower and then that female tetraploid sets seed and those seeds are triploid. And then those seeds get harvested, raised up and sold to the farmer for planting in the field to make triploid fruits that then go to market and don't have seeds. So with hemp, as I said, it's a, it's a natural diploid and there really are no known tetraploids. In the plant kingdom, there are natural polyploid species, unlike in the animal kingdom. All animals are diploids. But in the plant kingdom, you can have different ploidy levels. However, with hemp, it's pretty much just diploid, just like humans. I think there's one report of a single tetraploid plant that was found recently in India. So if you want to make a triploid, you first have to make a tetraploid. And we can do that. My lab has worked out a protocol um, using a compound called colchicine, which is actually from a plant called colchicum. And pre-germinated seed, which you see here in the center pick, pre-germinated means the root or the radical is, is just started to emerge from the seed, seed coat. So right at this stage, we treat them with this colchicine. And this colchicine, what it does is it stops growth temporarily and the DNA doubles itself. So it goes from a diploid to a tetraploid cell. And then you remove that colchicine, wash it away, and then the plant starts growing with twice the amount of DNA in its cells. Sometimes colchicine is called um, um, a, a mitosis inhibitor because it inhibits cell division temporarily to allow for a doubling. So we made tetraploid hemp. Uh, what you're seeing on this slide is the, the strain or the cultivar wife. So uh, on the left here is a tetraploid wife plant, and on the right is a diploid wife plant. And they have a different growth habit. The leaves are a little bit different, the color, the stem width, the branching. Um, the inflorescences look a little different. The leaves themselves have larger stomates, which are the, um, the pores on the undersides of the leaves that allow for gas exchange photosynthesis and respiration. Um, everything that we worked with to date has been with the cultivar wife due to the license restriction on using a single cultivar and not being able to cross. So this is a triploid wife plant. So we crossed a tetraploid and a diploid and got a triploid. Um, and what's showing here is the, the stomate here, this is a diploid, this is a tetraploid, and this is a triploid, which has intermediate size stomates, but similar number per square area of leaf to the diploid. And then what's up top here is the cytological evidence that this is truly what we think it is. Here is, these are, each one of these is called a histogram, and the large peak indicates the quantity of DNA and the the x-axis here shows the amount. So for the diploid we're at around a hundred thousand, 
And for the tetraploid was probably around, I think it averaged around 115 and it was 96% more DNA in the tetraploid, which is roughly double. And the triploid peak is right in between, exactly where we would expect it to be. So the process for developing tetraploids and our experience creating a triploid was published in Hort Science Journal. And um, this is an open access journal, so you can, you can get this and you could have the protocol for you. Um, I should have mentioned Lauren right from the start, but I'll certainly mention her at the end. Lauren Kurtz is the first author on this paper. She is my graduate student and she's done most of this work. Um, here is on the right, an advertisement from Oregon CBD. Perhaps you've heard of this seed company. They're quite well known on the West Coast for their genetics. They are offering the first seedless triploids this year. I think they're already for sale. And you can see they advertise infertile flowers. So you won't seed your neighbor. You won't set seed yourself. They are also reporting increased terpene content. They, they advertise reduced labor because of uh, no males, no need to cull males. So hiring crews. They also talk a little bit about cannabinoids. However, this information is quite specific to their genetics um, as far as their varin rich and their CBG types. But triploid seed um, is recognized as a potential, you know, new option for growers, especially in areas where pollen drift is a problem. So once we made these triploids, we set out to really prove that they are seedless. Um, one thing in this advertisement, um, whoops, is that there's no data to support it and they're not required to provide data. Uh, you take a leap of faith when you buy seed from anyone, you have some supporting information, they're certainly reputable, but are they truly seedless? So um, we recently completed this study, but we, and what we did is we, we challenged the fertility of these plants with male pollen. So that's something I'm not sure growers were willing to bring on farm. Male pollen is quite dangerous to the crop. But um, so we had lots of pollen in this section. And here's Lauren masked up <laughs> pollinating a shoot tip with lots of male pollen thoroughly. Hopefully you can see that video. Okay, so we saw pretty much what um, they are reporting. Here is the diploid setting seed tremendously and the triploids did not set seed, not much at all. Um, they also, we measured some parameters of growth. We also measured CBD and THC, but to be fair, this is not a very good comparison because the diploids were setting seed and that can alter their CBD production. So if you want to evaluate triploid performance compared to diploid, you would want to do that without pollen challenge in a separate experiment. But here you can see the triploids were definitely less seeded. This is on this picture here, the diploids produced about 3000 seed per plant and 88% of those were, had a nice healthy brown seed coat indicating a viable seed. And the triploids produced on average 100 seed per plant, only 8% you know, of which were actually brown. And when you cut these seeds open of the triploid, you can see here they are largely inviable. They are lacking endosperm, which is the nutritive tissue in the seed that supports the embryo upon germination. The diploid seed have a nice white intact endosperm and uh, cotyledons, which absorb the endosperm and the triploids do not. They're largely hollow or completely malformed and irregular in shape. 
So why do we get a little bit of seed set? I won't go into that in too much detail, but it's kind of like if you buy a watermelon and you cut into the watermelon and you see like one seed, that's kind of what you're gonna get with a triploid most likely. Will that seed dilute your seed oil? No. Will it, you know, change your CBD production? Probably not going to affect that. So compared to a diploid, it, it has much less risk in that department. But the reason why we are seeing seed is because every once in a while, the egg that is formed inside the triploid mother may get the right combination of genetic material that it can combine or that it can survive on its own. So currently we're researching, um, one thing that, that had to happen when we made our triploid, we followed the breeders that work with watermelon and citrus and banana, and we used a tetraploid plant as our mother. And the tetraploids don't make a very good mother. And so the seeds started to abort. So we had to rescue the embryo using a technique called embryo rescue and uh, in vitro conditions like you see here. This is really not practical for a grower like Oregon CBD who wants to sell a seed crop or produce seed for their own crop. And we hypothesize that a diploid will be the better mother and the tetraploid pollen. We need tetraploid pollen. So that's what we're evaluating right now as we speak. And we want to evaluate the sterility and the performance of outcrosses. So instead of just working with one genotype or wife, we want to outcross to see if we get more vigor in the seed. Um, we also are looking to develop an autoflowering triploid. This is my last slide. So autoflowering you may be familiar with means it's not photoperiod sensitive. So it, um, it's, it moves to flower just with age. Sometimes they're called day neutral plants. They are faster to harvest and some consider to be maybe a, a good idea for northern climates which have a much shorter growing season. Many people say they're for, not for beginners because the roots are very sensitive to transplant timing and if they are stressed in any abnormal way it can trigger flowering very early on and result in a, in a poor plant for production. Autoflowering is a recessive trait, a homozygous recessive trait, meaning it only shows up if you have um, two autoflowering alleles in the, in the genotype, and that can make breeding a challenge, especially for developing triploids. So I have no idea how long this took me. Hopefully I'm not over time too much or under dramatically, but I want to just take a moment to thank Lauren Kurtz, my graduate student. She all of the work with the culture scene was part of her master's degree, which she defended uh, in November, but she's uh, going on to do a doctoral degree in my lab. Um, my colleague Mark Brand at UConn, Atlas Seed for donating some of the autoflowering genetics we're now working with, and um, the UConn Greenhouse and Farm staff. Thank you. Great, Jessica. Thank you so much. I find that super interesting. Um, and I'm sure there'll be, there will be questions popping up in the Q&A um, for the end, but really quick. So just as far as your opinion as, uh, you know, as um, a geneticist and as somebody who's working in this field, where do you see, I know obviously for pollen drift, but um, where, where do you see the real market for this? It, will it be for large scale farms or do you see it applicable to, you know, you know, smaller hemp farms that you might, just a couple of acres and whatnot? I think that it's for outdoor production, probably more than indoor. However, pollen, if you have a nearby neighbor that's doing fiber or grain, you're going, you can have pollen coming in the vents and, and um, coming in the greenhouse. So um, it may be useful there. I think it remains to be seen whether a triploid has attributes that are advantageous over a diploid. So I think Oregon CBD alludes to that a little bit as far as their terpenes, but I'm not sure CBD is going to be much better. A lot of times with a polyploid, like a tetraploid, you'll have enhanced 
um, growth or enhanced metabolites, but sometimes it, that's not always the case. There's so much DNA that the secondary metabolites, which cannabinoids are, don't get the, the inputs that it, it, you'd think it would. So I think they need to be studied a little bit more for performance. Um, you know, I think Oregon CBD and others are catching on that you want inbred parent lines to create an F1 hybrid for uniformity in production. Mm -hmm. Possibly the ploidy breeding can be useful in, in getting that narrowed down. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if, it, if they are really superior as far as CBD and THC, what that, what that is yet. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so next up on our speaker list today is, um, is a grower, Christopher Verney. He's joining us from Northwest Cultivations. Um, he's co-owner and chief cultivation officer. I like that title, Chris. It sounds um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, they're a sustainable hemp nursery located in Sharon, Connecticut. Chris has a BA in environmental studies and a master's in ecological agri agriculture with a Focus in biointensive micro farming. So, Chris, we can't wait to hear about your experience growing hemp. Thank you. Um, hold on, I'll pull my slides up here. So, yeah, hi, my name's Chris, and um, so I am uh, a grower here in Sharon, Connecticut. We are running. Oh, hold on, once. A. I'm just getting my slides queued up. Um, so we are running a 15,000 square foot uh, nursery, and some of you may be familiar with the old graystone greenhouses out here. Um, and what we're doing is we are a full curation um, hemp varietal nursery. So we do everything from seed uh, to seedling to plant production. And here, um, I'm going to pull through here. One second. And hold on, we're having a little technical difficulty with my slide at the moment. Um, but so I'll just, I'll keep moving on. So we started out about a year ago um, with my experience. You know, I was growing in Northern California. Um, I'm originally from the East Coast. And I realized that, well, you know, noticing the how the cannabis industry and the hemp industry were progressing that there was uh, extreme need for uh, stable and reliable hemp genetics because during the first few years of hemp farming, there were multiple issues such as, uh, you know, susceptibility to pests and molds and mildews, as well as most of the genetics that were out on the market were failing their, uh, their federal legal limits for THC content. So it, it seemed like a logical step to try and create a space um, to house genetics for farmers to uh, help ensure the local success of farmers through genetics. Um, here is a shot of our first event. This was when we were at the Harvest Cup two years ago now, and it was just kind of very eye-opening experience because it was interesting just to see how many people uh, in New England were so interested and being advocates for this industry and we're wanting to participate uh, in many levels. Um, so the genetics that we have here, you know, we realize we have to start with, you know, healthy seed. Seed stock is kind of integral to what we're doing. So here we have partnered with uh, Davis um, Herb Farm and Hemp Farm out of Oregon. And these guys, we chose to work with them um, because they, they have produced, uh, they work with feral land race genetics as their base. They're, they're not as highly hybridized as a lot of the other uh, varietals that are out on the market right now. So they run, uh, you know, there's a 99, 98% success rate of them coming within the federal limit, but they're also highly stable. They are a little bit less susceptible to say the varying conditions in the environment such as temperature, uh, they're, they're more uh, drought resistant, disease resistant, and pest resistant as well. Um, so 
you know, we start with our seed, we move into our seedlings here. Um, and we are looking for specific varietals that we're working with that, you know, they have a chemotype of CBD for high CBD production um, while, you know, expressing unique terpene profiles. Um, yet they are also um, exhibit minor cabin cabinoid profiles and expressions. So there's kind of a wide variety of uh, expression that we will get um, through utilizing these seedlings and seeds. And here's just another shot. So we go from our seed to our seedling. And, you know, through all of this, we're tracking our germination rates um, and our seedling growth. And we found that, you know, during our first year, there was extreme uniformity. And through all of the seed that we started, we, we, we grew over 10,000 plants this year, and we had about a 95% germination rate, which, which was pretty amazing. Um, again, we're just kind of going through the different stages because we have some of our seedlings at six inches, then we move them up into five inch pots here um, to kind of give a little bit of variety as far as what plants we offer at the nursery. And then this is kind of like a full uh, shot of the nursery in its glory, we have every stage of growth because while we are utilizing our seedlings, we're also growing our plants out to veg. And then we were running towards the end of the season after we were finished um, with our nursery stock, which is, you know, we probably got sold the rest of our all the plants in July. Um, we then did flower trials, um, which, which was, Definitely, uh, it was interesting because we were able to run all of our varietals and test them in a greenhouse space um, while we worked with about, you know, we worked with probably about 20 different farms from Maine, or I'm sorry, from Vermont to Pennsylvania um, to gather data to see how these genetics uh, would handle different um, bioregions and how they would do in different environments such as a, a greenhouse. Um, and the tri we, did, we did very well with our trials, especially in our greenhouse. That was, uh, these greenhouses were created to be, um, they were propagation greenhouses in the beginning. So transitioning them to flower was, uh, was definitely, um, it took a lot of time and we got to see what strains adapted to different high stress environments, um, which I want to say was part of the plan, but it was, it was definitely an unexpected, uh, test for the validity of the genetics that we're growing. Um, let's see here. So, you know, we, I say that we're a sustainable nursery, you know, we're not certified organic, although we're working on our organic certification uh, and or above certif uh, organic certification, such um, as sun and earth certification, but everything that we do and utilize here uh, is organic. It's on the approved list for Connecticut and we and New York. And we're, we're trying to follow, you know, when people come across state lines that we have genetics that are utilizing products. You know, our plants have products that are able to be used in other states. Um, and we also have a phyto certification as well as they cross um, state lines. So we like to use biologics from Copert um, you know, we were using sachets of Priscilla's Californicus um, and cucurbits uh, to uh, as beneficial mites. We use uh, beneficial bacteria and fungi in compost teas that we brew, such as trichoderma. Um, and then we also use uh, predatory mites in our soils, um, as well as nematodes to combat things such as uh, fungus gnat larvae. Um, and then here's just kind of a shot of what the greenhouse look like with our sachets on the plants there. Um, and then, you know, part of being a sustainable nursery, aside from trying to minimize our inputs and, you know, work with specific tenants where we're trying to be, you know, have as minimal impact on what we're doing as possible, uh, catch as much runoff or rainwater as we can. We're trying to create an environment of biodiversity within the greenhouse space. Um, so, you know, a lot of the reason that we chose the specific strains that we do because, you know, learning about the conditions in the Northeast and especially in New England, um, there are a lot of challenges here that growers face. And, you know, like I said, as we're searching for high CBD and 
you know, unique terpene profiles, cannabinoid content. We also want our yields, you know, we're also looking for the highest yields that we can get as growers. Um, and I wanted to make these things that were, all of these goals attainable to farmers who are facing uh, adver you know, adverse conditions like in the Northeast, because here we're, there's a lot of experience for uh, shorter growing seasons, erratic weather, uh, different pests and pathogens say than in other places because of these situations. So, you know, there's some common pests that we see on uh, hemp. You know, one here was, uh, was, you know, hemp aphids. We had spider mites, we had uh, hemp russet mites and the European corn stalk borer, the hemp borer. Um, so part of what we're doing and trialing here is we are doing our testing to see what strains we have that are most resistant to these particular pests. And that's me just uh, applying a little bit of uh, fungal and bacteria yet to our foliar, uh, as a foliar spray. Um, and then, you know, on, on top of finding genetics that are uh, resistant to those pests, we're also trying to find genetics that help to mitigate these common problems such as powdery mildew, uh, botrytis or bud mold, and uh, leaf septoria or leaf spot, um, which was interesting because in a field trial that we had been working with um, on one of our biggest clients, which is the hemp division uh, of Harney's Teas, um, they last season had a very prominent issue with, uh, with the leaf spot um, and it took over maybe three quarters of their field. Now this season, we provided them with all of their genetics and they, realized that they did not have, they, they had about maybe 5% of the plants that were affected and it was closest to the border for, uh, to, to where uh, the forest line is there um, for the oak trees. So we were just seeing uh, as in, in many places we can to help to find some of these genetics and through the genetics that we run, we've documented which specific strains did better in these uh, specific areas. Um, and this is just to show that, yeah, working through all of this, one of the biggest things that we, you know, one of my main goals by doing this is creating partnerships, building local community and sharing knowledge and experience. And, you know, our main partners are me being from, spending time out in Northern California, um, Hendrix of Humboldt, California, who is a nursery as well, and Davis, through all of our combined knowledge and collaboration, we we're able to create something here and adapt it to uh, New England and Connecticut to kind of share our experience and knowledge and uh, make connections with local farmers. Um, let's see, and then this is a shot of some of our plants in the greenhouse that were in flower and we were lucky enough to be sponsored by Floraflex, which is a nutrient and irrigation company, and they saw the value of partnering with small hemp farms um, to help build local communities, but also for be able to trial their irrigation supplies and nutrient. And they're not considered 100% organic. They are a salt-based nutrient, but one of their one of their their bloom nutrients and part A of both their bloom and veg nutrients are certified organic. And they're working on the rest of their product line to be so. So I don't know if I would use salt-based nutrients in field trials so much, but in more of a greenhouse situation. Um, it worked beautifully. Um, and so, you know, we get down to our genetics and our field trials uh, a little bit more. Um, this is just an example of a farm that we worked with in Vermont that had a very early hard frost. And I want to say it was towards the end of September, beginning of October, and it was completely unexpected. And this is a strain here called Purple Emperor. And half of this field took this frost on and um, it, these, these plants un, were able to push out of this frost and he was able to have a successful harvest, which was, was really amazing actually. So we get down to the specific strains that we carry through Davis, one of them being the Purple Emperor. Another was called the Painted Lady. Uh, we have one called Apollo and uh, we have another one the, the Apollo, the Purple Emperor, and the Painted Lady were the three that we ran here that we had the most success um, in, in Connecticut. Uh, Skipper was another variety that we ran in the greenhouse that we, we had 
specific success with um, an 88. But I just show these pictures because not only were these strains particularly hardy and resistant, but they were also beautiful, produced extremely terpene rich, uh, diverse cannabinoid profiles. We had some ratios of cannabinoid ratios of 25 to one or 30 to one. Um, and they produced extremely well in field trials, um, producing maybe in certain situations, one and a half to two pounds per plant. Being feral genetics, they were able to run a little bit longer, say uh, pushing them a little bit longer in the harvest window to uh, extend their harvest time and get a little bit more of that weight for, for uh, yields. For, for farmers. So one of the main things we're doing here, aside from selling seedlings, we did our own flower trials. Um, we are really looking to create uh, acclimatized local genetics. So two projects that we're working on. One is we are working to create with Davis Genetics uh, an F2 varietal that we will be breeding here um, to, for seed production to be able to put out next season. So we will be adapting their strains to our area, um, which is really exciting because it, it, ta I mean, it, it takes multiple seasons to acclimatize strains, but this is one step in the right direction. And I, I don't know of many other nurseries or farms who are doing this right now. Um, the second project that we are working on, which is probably is a main focus for us right now, is we are working with Hendrix and a division of Hendrix called Sprout Life to actually create a new strain that they have been working on through Sprout Life called the Wild Susie. Um, and the Wild Susie is a combination of Compulte, which is a, uh, the Compulte and Ringo's Gift. Um, now Ringo's Gift is an old world Hungarian hemp. It's a fiber strain. So it's super, it's fusarium resistant, it's hardy. Um, it is just one of those, uh, it is genetically sound. It is an old world land race strain, combining it with a classic high CBD strain, Ringo's Gift, which it is, Ringo's Gift is more of a flower, high CBD, terpene rich strain created in Northern California from Ringo. He was an activist. He uh, bred the strain to actually help treat and cure his own cancer. Um, so this is one strain you're taking that is genetically resistant to Fusarium will. You're taking it and crossing it with another strain uh, that is high in CBD. And we're, we're now working with these genetics here and um, we are, have an active trial going on where we basically, we started with 5,000 seeds, we sprouted them, we took their germination rates, we did our seedling selection, we culled the weak, we culled the males. Now we have about, uh, from there we have now about three to 400 plants that we're working with in veg. Um, and through the winter, we will be creating more stock to then create clonal stock for field trials come in the spring. Um, so this is kind of one thing that we see is going to be very important moving forward is, is creating these genetics with farmer input locally um, to help uh, combat these locally acclimatized bioregions, um, aside from just getting any seeds from anywhere or plants uh, and hope that they actually perform in the area in which we are because, you know, everywhere is very, very different. And that was one of the other reasons why we chose to go with Davis because we knew not only was he growing in Oregon, but there were, there were field trials being going on at the University of Virginia and the University of Vermont. So we knew the genetics that we were working with um, were already being trialed in other areas, one, you know, very similar um, to ours. So that being said, you, you know, I'm not going to get too much into uh, any sort of breeding information. Um, we work with here with Corey uh, Fink with Focus Seeds. He is a vegetable seed breeder and he is participating on our hemp trials. Uh, so it's been nice to have him on board um, to help with all of these things. Uh, I, I'm learning a lot. And then this is just kind of a 
this is just a flower trial that we're doing, we were doing in the greenhouse, but um, there was a lot of potential in what we were growing here. Um, and la lastly, you know, we're working on these projects. We're, we're, we're looking into the next step of the phase of what we're doing is um, we're looking into seed certification and genetic registration here for uh, seed IP and production. And this is what's gonna help get us into being able to distribute genetics to help uh, have them trialed and uh, grown in various spots. So this is something we're looking into now. Um, we're hoping to be a participant in this process, maybe to help shape uh, seed registration and certification in the state. Um, I know there's some folks who are on here or who, who may be listening that would be interesting to talk to and maybe collaborate and participate on such uh, projects. Um, but right now, this is kind of where we where we are. And going into this season, you know, we have we have we have lots of, of goals for this year. Um, mostly just making connections, uh, working more with local farms to help uh, perpetuate these genetics, um, creating proprietary genetic uh, curation service. Because not only, you know, do I feel like I want to sell plants to people. I, I want to collaborate and I want to learn and I want to be able to uh, come and share knowledge and information, um, set up trial plots and just be a conduit to, to the best genetics we possibly can have in the, in the, uh, in the local community. Um, so that being said, I think I'm going to yield my time um, and uh, yeah, this last slide is just our, our contact information here. Uh, we'd be very great to hear from everybody if anybody has any questions. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris. Great, You're great welcome. presentation. Um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in, in our little small state, you know. So it's always nice to hear from another farmer doing some good stuff. Definitely. Um, so. What, what we have is we have a Q&A um, function that anybody can use now to, to go live with some questions. Um, and while we're waiting for those to pop up, I just want to, I just want to, because our introduction was cut short due to technical stuff, I just want to pop up um, a quick slide here and, um, and thank, thank the organizers and talk about what's, what's, coming, um, what's coming up next month. So hold on one sec here. Okay, so I don't know if you guys can see my screen here. But today was put together um, as a collaboration between um, the Connecticut Resource Conservation and Development Group, the Department of Ag, UConn, um, USDA, and CHIA, the Connecticut Hemp Industry Association. Um, we'll be doing webinar series for the, for the upcoming months, um, once, once a month on Wednesdays, a little lunch break with us, um, and trying to feature local as well as, you know, pertinent information um, to aid hemp farmers and anybody really interested in the industry. We're sort of taking a format that goes from seed to sale, oops, um, from seed to sale. And so we will, um, We'll do, right now we're talking about early stages of cultiva cultivation and application process. We'll be moving into um, the growing season, successful transplantation and harvesting, and then processing. And, um, and hopefully at the end, we'll be able to do um, at least a web some webinars on marketing and, um, and you know, getting your, getting your um, product sold, because that's the goal, right? Um, and... Yeah, so I do see some po questions popping up now. So let me um, let me go ahead and do that. So we have Kieran here. Kate, this one's for you. If you um, 
if you're still with us. I plan on growing hemp, fiber hemp that involves harvesting before flowering. The legislation, as I understand, requires testing of flowers specifically. How would I sample pre-flowering? Alrighty, so our sampling procedures say that you have to sample the top two to three inches of the plant. Um, so the, the primary the primary bud there or the primary part of the plant. So even though it's if it doesn't, if it's not flowering at that moment, but you still are planning on harvesting, you do have to collect a sample following our sampling procedures. Um, so yeah. That should answer that question. And just a comment on our sampling procedures. We are um, going to be reviewing USDA's sampling procedures that they put out. So our sampling procedures may be changing in the future. Great. So um, re very related to that is um, Ashley Austin is asking, what's the best way to get all the rules for planting and testing? So I don't know if you have a link easy to pop up, but um, she's, I think she's asking specifically about CBD levels. Um, we don't require testing of CBD. We just do THC, um, levels. That's what we care about. Um, but as far as rules for planting, um, and testing, you can visit our website, um, which I can, can I, should I put that in the chat function? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I can do that. I'll put our website in the chat function and we have some guidance documents and instruction documents up there and we will be adding more um, in the next few months. Okay, great. Um, so next, next month, um, oh, this is the wrong one, sorry. Um, so next month, hopefully we'll have all of our technical um, difficulties worked out. And we will go ahead and have another webinar um, to focusing on, on transplanting and growing. Um, Mike Goodenough from Sweet Heal will be joining us as well as, um, I unfortunately don't have this up right now. Um, sorry. Jeff, chime in here for me, buddy. <laughs> Oh, sorry guys, I don't have the itinerary. Um, thank you, Amanda, I appreciate that. Great, so next next um, will be February 17th. We'll be hearing from Mike Goodenough and Christian Lujabuel um, from Artisan, Artisanal Hemp Company and Triple C Ranch. Um, and Mike Goodenough's from Sweet Hill. And so they're going to be talking about propagation, cloning, and, um, and successful, successful start. Um, and so we look forward to that on February 17th, same time. And like I said, hopefully some of our uh, technical glitches will be addressed and it should go off with, that, with uh, great success. Um, there's links here, you're, you're looking to register, to pre-register so that you get the Zoom link. And um, yeah, so thank you everybody for joining us. Um, thank you so much. And, you know, again, we apologize for the rough start, but uh, we look forward to joining you next month. Anything else?